Well, welcome everyone. I'm Dave Skinner, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Industrial Power at Cree Wolfspeed. I'd like to thank you all for attending this third installment of our webinar series on the changes that silicon carbide is making in the power industry and how Cree Wolfspeed is enabling those changes. Today we're going to walk through the challenges that one of the biggest power consuming applications in the world is facing, servers and data centers. We'll have a few polling questions throughout the presentation, and they're really just meant to help us see each other's perspectives and experiences with the technology, as well as the challenges that we're all facing in the market together. So just to level set with all of us, we'll just quickly talk about what silicon carbide is. It's a wide band gap semiconductor base material. It's actually a very close cousin to diamond. It's very rare in nature, so we've been perfecting the art of making synthetic silicon carbide for the last 30 years. In a nutshell, we take sand and coal at one end of the factory, and after some considerable processing and extreme temperatures, we turn them into power diodes and MOSFETs that come in a few different forms. We make bare dye, discrete devices in various through hole and surface mount packages, and power modules. Which one you'd use really just depends on your application. So why have we been working on this for the past 30 years? Well, we've determined that when the system is designed properly, the physical characteristics of silicon carbide, like the relatively constant on resistance over temperature, enables much more efficient power conversion than silicon. The devices have much lower losses than silicon at faster switching speeds, and as a cousin to diamond, which is the best heat conducting material in the world, silicon carbide has better thermal performance across the board than other semiconductor technologies. So now we're at our first polling question. What are the biggest challenges to overcome in power supply design? We've got A, thermal, B, cost, and C, efficiency. And our results are around 46% said thermal, 20% said cost, and 35% said efficiency. Well, I'm definitely glad to see that two of the biggest challenges uh, we're directly addressing with our silicon carbide power device development. Uh, and actually, cost is something that we're, we'll be addressing as well. Uh, more to come at the end of the presentation, so stay tuned. Now let's talk about data centers. Every time we open a web browser, every time we stream a video, every time we watch a riveting presentation on silicon carbide power technology, you are hitting a data center. So today, over 3% of the United States electricity is used to power data centers, and that's projected to get to almost 15% by 2050. If you think about it, that's not that far away. Now, the surprising thing is that up to 40% of the electricity used in a data center isn't to manage the data, it's to keep the place cool. Now, that's where silicon carbide comes in. Over the 10 year period from 2010 to 2020, the use of silicon carbide in server power supplies, it's primarily diodes, uh, is estimated to save around 620 billion kilowatt hours. Now to put things in perspective, every 10,000 kilowatt hours saved can on average power one home for an entire year. Pretty significant impact. So there are several ways to solve the heat problem. Microsoft has a creative research project going on. Essentially, they've taken a server farm about the size of a shipping container, put it in a submarine-like container, and then sunk it about 190 feet down off the coast of Scotland. Obviously, the ocean's pretty cold down there, and so using that as the heat exchanger is a pretty efficient way to get the heat out. Um, now, of course, there may be objections to heating the heat, heating the ocean up, and depending on which disaster movie you watch, it could be really bad. But uh, it's really only heating up the ocean about 0.1 degrees C, maybe five feet away, so it's not that big of a of a temperature change. But again, this is a this is a pretty creative research project, and may not be practical uh, long term. Now, the industry itself is looking at uh, these two different types of architectures. And this is actually stemming from folks like Facebook, um, uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft to um, basically build buildings that have thousands of servers in them. And you can scale them in one of two ways. Uh, this hyperscale allows you to scale your computing power and your storage capabilities independently. So when you need more processing, you just copy and paste that block. When you need more storage, copy and paste that block. 
and hyper-converged is more for smaller uh, data centers or smaller offices where you want the computing power and storage together. So when you need more of, of that capability, more of those capabilities, you just copy and paste that. Now, uh, they do both enable fast scalability. Uh, but again, like I said, there's, now it's thousands of servers to keep cool. And there's actually active power management from the CPU all the way out to the building design itself. Um, there's, I mean, it is, it is a, a whole architecture. There's software that actually talks to the different power supplies and talks to the different servers to make sure we don't see any hot spots. So let's take a look at the efficiency requirements real quick. So 80 plus started back in 2004. And as you can see, it's evolved over time to increasingly precious metals. Uh, silicon carbide diodes have actually been used to achieve gold and platinum for the last 10, 10 or so years. Uh, now the challenge to get to is 80 plus titanium. And if you notice, uh, there the 50% load is now at 96%, doesn't give much room uh, for any kind of inefficiencies in the system. And now we've got a light load requirement of about 90%. And as we all know, achieving light load performance is uh, one of the biggest challenges in power supply designs. We're all familiar with Energy Star. Every time you buy an appliance or TV, you get the yellow sticker. Uh, but what I want to show you here is the next version of Energy Star, version 3, which will be out in about a week. They're following the, the, the 80 plus standards. Now the impact that has is now power supplies in a lot of different applications now have to be hitting a much higher standard and hitting a lot higher efficiency. So it has an impact across the entire uh, power supply market. So speaking of designs to standards, what standard are you designing your power supplies to today? A is 80 plus silver, B is gold, C is platinum, and D is titanium. And survey says around 3% said silver, around 26% said gold, around 39% said platinum, and around 32% said titanium. Uh, this seems to me be about right based on where we are today. I bet if you looked at it a year ago, there'd be hardly any titanium. And I bet if we looked at it a year from now, a lot of, maybe the majority of this would be titanium. And that's what's where silicon carbide is going to help. So uh, one of the key places where uh, efficiency is important is in the front end, the uh, AC to DC power factor correction front end. Uh, I had a chance to talk with a lot of different server manufacturers over the last couple of weeks, server power supply manufacturers. And the typical system specs uh, that they try to hit, you can see on the right, Input voltage between 180 and 260 uh, volts. Output voltage almost always fixed at 400 volts. The switching frequency can range from 85 to 120 kilohertz. And the output power is typically between 1 and 3 kilowatts. Uh, and to, in order to hit the titanium standard, the peak efficiency really needs to be, of course, as close to 100% as possible, but no lower than 98.5%. So I wanted to show you on the left uh, a reference design that we built uh, that we took some measurements on to try to get to this high efficiency level. It's a 2.2 kilowatt totem pole uh, PFC, and that design you, know, you can find on wolfspeed.com. You can also see uh, by the dimensions there the small size, uh, which is critical to help hitting uh, high power density, which you'll see is a very critical spec going forward. So let's talk about a couple of the different PFC topologies. The uh, traditional interleaf boost technology you see on the left, it works very well, it's cost effective, and it's not overly complicated to implement. The high frequency MOSFETs can be driven with the same PWM signal as if you had a single boost, and using the two inductors can help with heat dissipation compared to just having one, but that also increases the total system cost. This topology also tops out at around 95% efficiency. Um, with silicon MOSFETs, the reverse recovery time of the MOSFET body diode causes high losses, 
so which requires us to run in either discontinuous or critical conduction mode which really limits the system to platinum plus at best. Now the full bridge totem pole on the right does get you there. We swapped out the two high frequency MOSFETs to silicon carbide MOSFETs and because the reverse recovery time is essentially zero with silicon carbide we can run in continuous conduction mode or hard switching. That is very difficult to achieve with traditional silicon. Uh, but we still are using two silicon MOSFETs uh, for the low frequency side to give you the absolute best performance. Uh, and when you do this implementation, you can get up, up to 99%, maybe a little higher than 99%. Challenge is now we've increased the comp complexity because now we're driving the gates of four transistors and it increases the cost of the, of the PFC but still the, one of the most efficient implementations you can get to. Here's another implementation. Uh, it's a hybrid approach that it's actually something that we couldn't do before we had silicon carbide MOSFETs. So we still benefit from the ability to run in hard switching mode and because we're so efficient in the high frequency leg we can get away with using just regular old traditional pin diodes on the low frequency side. What this does is it helps us minimize the complexity and total cost of the solution without sacrificing much efficiency. The light load efficiency is slightly lower, around half a percent compared to the full bridge, but that's still, as you can see, it, it provides quite a bit of margin for, uh, for the rest of the system. So that brings us to our next poll question. What are you using today for MOSFETs in your power supply designs? A, silicon MOSFETs, B, GAN MOSFETs, C, silicon carbide MOSFETs. And we'll take a look at the results. So the vast majority is uh, working in silicon, 70%. And then between GAN and silicon carbide, it's almost a 50-50 split, 14% for GAN and 16% for silicon carbide. Uh, definitely good to see that folks are working um, with wideband gap technologies like GAN and silicon carbide. We actually do uh, make GAN on silicon carbide products. Uh, we focus on them for, with, on that technology for RF applications, and we focus on silicon carbide for power applications. The uh, and I bet, again, if we take a look at this, uh, these, this poll a year from now, we'll probably see a lot more on the silicon carbide side. So let's see how well that hybrid approach performed. So as you can see at the low load, a light load, we're over 97%, around 97.3%. And at 50% load, we're very close to 99 about 98.6, 98.7. And at 100% load, we're right at 98.5. Now the great thing about this is we've now given the rest of the system a little over 7% margin to, uh, to hit the, the 80 plus titanium standard. And at 50% load, where you really design the system to, uh, it's, uh, you hit, um, you've got around 3.5%, uh, a little over 3.5% margin. For the rest of the system. So this is where this is one of the places where silicon carbide really does help and uh, ease ease the load off the rest of the system. So the real goal is to increase the power density, uh, and the way to do that, of course, is increasing the efficiency, reducing the heat. Uh, but if you look at the dent power density, which they uh, the data center and server industry are trying to just kilowatts per rack. Uh, today, it's in most of them are in the seven to ten kilowatt range, and the ten kilowatt as you uh, over ten kilowatt is not as high. But over time, in the very near future, you'll see the majority of designs going to ten kilowatt. And that's really driven by again those big data centers that are uh, looking to get higher and higher density up to 20 kilowatts. Some even have a target of almost 30 kilowatts. Some of the ways to do that, because eventually you're just going to run out of steam in terms of how efficient you can get 
uh, get the boost converter and get the DC to DC converter uh, without changing anything else in the system. Some of the ways that the whole architecture is changing is a lot of folks are looking at and uh, folks like Facebook and Microsoft are using higher input voltages. Uh, Facebook is running is running full 480 volt three phase using 277 as the input voltage. Uh, other ways to do it is to further increase the switching frequency. Uh, some of the power supply, actually many of the power supply, server power supply manufacturers are looking at going up to 200, 300, even up to 500 kilohertz um, in their designs. That, of course, makes the rest of the system smaller, makes all the rest of your components smaller, which again increases that power density. And again, these uh, hyperscale control algorithms and just the design of the building itself is also helping uh, optimize uh, getting the heat out and increasing that power density. So we've talked uh, quite a bit about uh, what moving from silicon to silicon carbide uh, brings you. But another point I'd like to make is that uh, you might not necessarily need to increase the efficiency of your product, but you may have a different design goal of getting the size and weight down uh, and one way to do that is by using a faster switching frequency that silicon carbide uh, would support your efficiency target or, or wouldn't lower your efficiency target by going up in, in, uh, in frequency. Uh, so you just have to think about what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you could even reduce the total number of components and uh, maybe even reduce your total cost uh, by, by moving to silicon carbide. So part of accelerating the adoption of silicon carbide is making sure we have the capacity in place to support the demand. So if you had a chance to attend uh, PCIM or you saw the announcement that our CEO made there, uh, we've recently announced that we're going to be spending a billion dollars over the next four years to grow our capacity 30x where we were a year ago uh, by 2024. Uh, what this will do is as uh, adoption continues and as 20% as, uh, of us mentioned back on the other poll that cost was a concern, as capacity gets full, I mean, as, as the capacity gets loaded, uh, you see prices come down. So we're adjusting the cost uh, target as well. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing, uh, we're definitely the largest manufacturer. We have number one market share. Uh, we invented the SICK MOSFET, and we have over 6 trillion hours of field, uh, field time with very low fit rates, uh, and very high reliability. Uh, we've been doing six, uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs for over six years, and even longer in diodes. We have thousands of customers with millions of parts in use. And we have, uh, because automotive is one of the biggest drivers of silicon carbide adoption, we're qualified to those types of standards. Final poll question. Have you tried silicon carbide in a power supply design? A, yes, B, no, and C, plan to give it a shot. And the final survey, 21% yes, 47% no, and 30% are planning to try. Well, hopefully over time, we can convert some of the no's to planning to try. And uh, one of the ways that we can help with that, we have uh, several reference designs, as well as demonstration platforms, as well as a uh, buck boost evaluation kit. You can order those on arrow.com. And we also have more information on silicon carbide technology, other reference designs, other application notes available on our website. So hopefully that can help you with your evaluation of silicon carbide. And as always, reach out to us or your local Aero um, representative for help. And uh, just want to thank you all for joining me today and hope you learned something. And uh, please join us for upcoming webinars on August 1st. We'll be talking about high power and solar string inverters. And on September 12th, we'll talk about onboard chargers in cars. So thank you all again, and hope everyone has a great day.